Miasen, Bonapita Gisagao, Crystal Layman, Sigason, Miskagekan, Nehio, Piagoskan, Ostesamao, or your serial wind, Nagotasik. My name is Crystal Layman, and I'm a member of the Beaver Lake Cree Nation. Um, so, how I ended up here was um, I took a big step back about maybe eight months ago, almost a year ago, um, from the traveling and you know, the, the very public speaking, um, to just be at home and do real work. Um, and that's not to discredit any of the, um, you know, the big rallies and protests and different things that I've attended. Um, but I really started to question, um, what are we doing? What are we actually doing in our communities? And so I just stayed home. And, um, and I believe it was somebody from the First Nations Indian Health Branch that emailed my aunt, uh, Marilyn Gladue, who's the health director for the Beaver Lake Cree Nation, um, the link to this conference. So that's how it happened. And my aunt was like, Crystal, you're going to this thing. Um, and you're going to tell them what <laughs> we've been doing and all of these things you've worked on. Uh, so that's how I ended up here. Um, so um, in the face of, the, of facts um, like 37% of Canada's greenhouse gas emissions coming out of Alberta um, and challenges we face as Indigenous peoples um, and in, in, in Indigenous communities um, being pushed to the margins through purposeful poverty and economic sanctions uh, meant to deny us our rightful place on and within our lands and territories. Um, so in the face of extreme poverty, our communities have become easy targets for corporate interests in resource exploitation. Um, and it's important to note that Indigenous leaderships cannot be um, blamed for this a dynamic uh, though um, it, is, it is a product of the Indian Act governance system and prescribed poverty that is also a feature of the Indian Act. So in the face of extreme energy, pipeline approvals, governments running rampant over our inherent and treaty rights, um, we're here. Um, we're here and we're not going anywhere and we're exercising self-determination and we are changing the language and shaping the economic and political ideologies of and for our children to be in line with sovereignty and traditional land use. So what did the Beaver Lake Cree do? And that's basically what I'm here to do is just tell you what we've done. I'm not here to offer any solutions or say that our way is the best way. Um, and so um, we, and I know, like, I hope there's no, like, hardcore vegans in here or anything that are like, what are you doing? Um, <laughs> so one thing that um, the Beaver Lake Cree did, um, actually back in the 80s, um, former retired chief Al Lehman uh, was chief for about 35 years in the Beaver Lake Cree Nation. And back in the 80s, they were already starting to experience um, food insecurity. And what he had said back then was, you know, there's going to come a time when our animals are going to get sick. They're already starting to get sick. Um, what am I going to do as a leader uh, to address this and to ensure that our people have, um, have food to eat? So what he did was, uh, along with his leadership and the community, uh, purchased, I believe at the time, 25 head of buffalo. I basically have like zero notes, so I'm just like going off the top of my head. Um, so they purchased about 25 head of buffalo, I believe, or maybe... Maybe it was 100, which is like a totally big difference. Um, but it was one of the two. <laughs> uh, nonetheless, um, we have now today about 600 head of buffalo, I believe, um, at last count. Um, and so a part of that is, is also bringing back, um, you know, you talked about um, how food has been used to um, administer control and oppression over Indigenous people. Uh, the buffalo was one of those um, examples. Um, and so this was a part of reclamation for, for the Beaver Lake Cree too in bringing the buffalo back to our community um, and back to our people. 
And so what we do now is uh, every year, um, what we've recently started doing in the last couple of years is we have a harvesting camp um, in, in probably the first or second week in, of October. And it's actually the health services that organizes that. And so what happens is for one week, uh, the community comes together in our ceremony, at our ceremony grounds, um, and we harvest food for an entire week. Uh, we take down, um, it used to be two head of buffalo. It went from one head of buffalo to two head of buffalo to now this year because we have so many community members and community um, and indigenous people from, and non-indigenous people from outside of Beaver Lake. Because the thing with Beaver Lake is um, we don't isolate. We welcome anybody who wants to come into the community to come and help and to come in, um, uh, go back to um, to land-based education and to reclamation and reconciliation practices around traditional land use. And so we actually have um, uh, other community members um, from like the Cold Lake First Nations as an example that come to the community and Kihu and Cree Nation, um, which are neighboring communities to ours, come and they come and help as well. And so this last, this last harvesting camp, we actually had to take four head of buffalo down um, because there's so many people now that are coming. So we take the buffalo down, our hunters are given protocol and you know what it is that they need and they go out and they hunt for the entire week, whatever they bring in um, throughout those um, five days. Uh, we, we fix, we start to fix those, those animals. Um, we, set, we set a net every night um, so there's pictures there, you'll see um, them untangling the net. So we set the net every night, we pull the net every morning. Um, and and the, the school is actively engaged in this, our elders council is actively engaged in this. And um, what it's really doing too is um, teaching our children about our traditional practices and about food preservation um, and bringing our children back to um, those original instructions as well. Um, so we're, we smoke the fish, we smoke the, the meat, whatever comes in, the buffalo and whatever else. Um, we, uh, this last camp, we started to learn about um, rendering things like bear fat uh, bear fat is something that we actively used to use in ceremony. Um, so that's the harvesting camp. Um, in July, we have a cultural camp, and at the cultural camp, uh, we pick berries, we pick medicine, um, and again, there's cultural protocol that goes around that. Um, the children's cultural, the children's camp that we have um, every summer has now joined with that. And so our children are there for a week and they're learning about protocol and they're learning about ceremony and they're learning about um, the exercise of, um, of uh, picking medicine and, and what goes along with that and the responsibilities around that. Um, so this, this really has been about um, exercising and acknowledging and practicing um, the fact that the very essence of who we are as Indigenous peoples is in the land um, and coming back to that and coming back to and defining um, land-based education um, and, and what that has to do with reclamation and reconciliation practices and what that's also doing is really helping our people um, in creating that um, uh, healthy communities, you know, and, and acknowledging that environmental health is is directly related to the mental health of our people. Um, and so now what we're seeing is this practice of going back to fundamental knowledge, common sense. So what else we did was um, in my transition out uh, maybe six months ago or so, maybe eight months, um, I decided I was going to go for my master's, uh, my MED um, in Indigenous Peoples Education. 
And so I was like, well, you know, I never got around to doing the community garden, so let's do that. Um, and I want to do a solar project, so let's do that too. Uh, so we did it. <laughs> um, and so what that's, what that's become is um, in the late fall, the Beaver Lake Cree um, planted a, or, okay, so, so what happened was um, I was asked to do these projects. Um, it, you know, it came out of a response from the health services where they wanted to address um, things like diabetes, uh, un um, unhealthy eating habits, um, clean eating, etc. cetera. Um, so there was some conversations around, well, what would, what would a community garden look like in the community? Um, and that then warped into a fruit orchard. <laughs> so, um, and this happened like, like spring of last year. Uh, and in the fall, we planted a 250 square foot by 150 square foot uh, fruit orchard. Um, and, and what that fruit orchard ended up being was um, phase one. And phase one was 84 apple trees and I believe 14 cherry trees. And so that's only phase one. Phase two is going to happen this, this spring. And how we went about that project um, and my team was we went according to the Canadian Food Guide for healthy eating and the recommended yearly intake of fruit. So our community population is about 400, so that was the number that we used. So when this fruit orchard is completed and it's you know, bearing fruit, um, we will have enough fruit to feed the entire community. Um, this fruit orchard will also start to help us address the disproportionate rates of diabetes. Um, it's going to create an apple program in the school. So the fruit orchard um, is now going to be a response to some of the issues that we're facing as Indigenous peoples in um, our health and in relation to food insecurity. Um, hold on. Okay, so adjacent to the fruit orchard is also a 150 square foot by 50 square foot community garden. Y'all are probably like, where's the community garden? Um, so the community garden is adjacent to that. And what ended up happening was, um, when I started talking about the fruit orchard and the community garden and our solar project was, I said, we need to start addressing, um, changing the political and economic um, ideologies of our children in that our children grew up in an oil and gas and um, resource exploitation um, era. And we need to start changing their language. We need to start introducing them to other ways of, of thinking and doing and reintroducing them to our, our indigenous ways of knowing and being. And so I said, because my second degree is a teaching degree, um, I said, it has to be at the school. That's the only way this is gonna work. So what the principal at the school did was she gave us the soccer field. <laughs> she was like, go ahead, take it, do whatever you wanna do with it. Okay, we're putting a fruit orchard, the community garden, great. Um, so what that also does is it brings our community to get together with our children um, in order to harvest the food. We have to do it at the school with the children um, and the solar project as well. So energy sovereignty, and I just, I know that this is a food place, food forum, but you know, this is, this is a part of it. Um, so coming from um, a treaty, um, Treaty 6 of 1876, the, the script is as long as the sun shines, the grass grows and the rivers flow. So taking from that, as long as the sun shines, um, this is the top of the Beaver Lake Cree Nation School. The Beaver Lake Cree Nation and the Keepers of the Athabasca uh, partnered together to launch a small scale, initially, uh, solar project in the community.
when we initially went to launch the project, it started out as a six kilowatt solar PV project, uh, which then ended up warping into a 24.65 uh, kilowatt project um, that we have now installed on the Beaver Lake Cree Nation Amiss Community School. Well, what really makes this an ideal location is that it's a school. And so all the youth are here. And I should have said before we even had any meetings uh, with the community, we had a poster contest for the students in Amisk School. And they produced uh, awesome artwork, just beautiful artwork that we then used for posters for our community meetings. So it was all inspired by the students and the youth. And it's all about them, right? Having a better future where they're not choking down coal fumes and you know trying to deal with out of hand fires from climate change and that sort of thing. It's all about providing a better future for them and, and they stepped up to the plate with their artwork so then we stepped up to the to their school with the with the solar panels. The elders have been in support of this project from right from the get-go. We've uh, we, we support anything the young people try to do that's gonna enhance their abilities, the reserve, the nation is going to benefit along with the young people, the young ladies and the young men that are taking this uh, solar panel course. They offered the course to whoever was interested and I was interested and it sounded something like I wouldn't mind to try to check out. Lessening our carbon in uh, footprint, which is kind of good for us, for ourselves uh, and for our community. The cost is actually one of the cheapest forms of electricity you can generate over a 30 year period. Uh, this is because you're essentially locking in your own rates for 30 years based on your upfront cost of the array. So phase two, our phase one, uh, that's only phase one. Um, so what the Beaver Lake Cree did is in the midst of me doing this project, the GOA announced the, um, Ab the Aboriginal Indigenous Solar Program money. And so we tapped into that and we'll now be installing phase two of our solar project um, in the spring. Um, the really cool thing about that is that um, in most communities you'll hear while looking around this room, there's majority are women, um, is, is the same thing in our community. A lot of the projects and, and initiatives that the community engages in is led by the women and the older women. And, and it's very seldom that we see a lot of our young men. Um, this is the very first time in our community um, in recent years that we have held a training and had, uh, we had 19, first of all, community members step forward, which is huge for us, because um, they weren't getting paid to be there. Um, 19 young people step forward. One was 55. Um, the rest were all young men, th um, 35 and under that stepped forward and took uh, the solar training. And, um, you know, the fact that our students were actively engaged in this um, was, was really, really important and really key um, in making this, this successful. Um, so the Beaver Lake Cree Nation are asserting their right to food security and putting to practice the exercise of food sovereignty. Um, and I just want to, you know, say this little last bit, you know, in, a, um, in about solidarity. Um, we must commit to consolidating our efforts in the collective control of our natural resources based on the principles of people's participation, gender equality, environmental and social justice, self-reliant and sustainable management systems while maintaining natural law and the systems rooted in that and not in the capitalist development, respecting Mother Earth and that includes viable solutions as opposed to false solutions to climate change. 
um, in our communities were demanding um, green economies defined by us that put a stop to the capitalism of Mother Nature. We're demanding systems that are founded in our right to self-determination, our permanent sovereignty over our traditional lands, territories, and resources, forests, water, and everything that sustains life. And we're doing this not only for us, but for all future generations, no matter their race, color, or creed. Um, and so I just wanted to say that much. Uh,